As Chris, was, uh, Chris mentioned, I'm an architect, uh, still registered, although uh, we, over the year we kind of evolved from an architectural practice. So uh, my business partner, Mariana Pickering, and I, uh, uh, we call ourselves recovering architects, uh, meaning that we spent uh, eight years back home in Italy uh, dealing with high performance project in uh, passive house buildings and whatnot. And uh, over the years, we uh, evolved into uh, becoming more and more specialized in uh, high performance solution for the building envelope. And so we uh, dropped the architectural practice. And what we do now is we train builders mostly, and we uh, help manufacturers develop their products uh, to meet climate specific requirements. I, I'm gonna uh, ex explain throughout this presentation uh, what I mean. But basically, the bottom line of what we're trying to do uh, with our job is to look at the uh, performance of buildings in terms of energy. But since buildings were invented in the first place for people, we try to also bring that uh, part of the equation uh, to the table, meaning that in my mind, a building that is energy efficient but is not healthy is not a good building. I'm going to show examples how uh, code has been uh, further ahead in Europe as far as requiring higher efficiency. Uh, and that has led over the years to buildings that had been more efficient, but way less healthy because of more decondensation. So um, I'm going to start with some uh, just uh, explaining what uh, some concepts are or what we're trying to do and then what some solution can be in our climate. Uh, before we get started, I would like to ask you some questions. Uh, how many do, of you guys have a mobile phone? How many of you guys have a mobile phone with more than 16 gig memory? 64 gigs. Mine is old, it doesn't. Uh, how many of, of you guys have a, uh, an, e, uh, an electric vehicle? Some, decent, okay. How many of you guys uh, know how much kilobit you, your building consumes for heating in a year? One, good for you. Uh, bottom line of this presentation, we know other uh, gadgets or other uh, objects that we use in, a, in our daily life much better than we know the buildings that we live in. And that is a big cultural issue. Uh, so when we talk about high performance, uh, in buildings, we should, you know, it comes to mind net zero, comes to mind passive solar. We're gonna talk about these, uh, but I'm pretty sure that nobody knows what's the temperature inside of your, uh, the surface on your, of your windows, because that is not, it doesn't typically come up in conversation. It's gonna come up today. I'm gonna, uh, I hope you walk out of uh, this presentation tonight, understand a little bit better how the individual components of a building can affect your life in a good or in a bad way. So with this, we're going to look at the healthy side of zero energy, uh, com uh, going over what is conservation versus compensation. That is, if you're talking about renewables or if you're talking about buildings, this is a big topic. And we're going to cover that at the beginning. Uh, buildings are for people, should be for people. They are often designed not for people. And me being an architect, you know, I, I, Back home, I studied, I don't know, I took six mandatory classes about uh, history of architecture. They kind of drilled in me why buildings are there. And we should keep that in mind when we talk about new technologies because the bottom line of buildings should be people first, energy second. Should be because code does not reflect that. And the evolution of code in Europe and in the States has not been reflecting that for a long time. Uh, we're going to look at what. Uh, what means to have healthy and comfortable building and how you can achieve that? And uh, what is the added value of high performance thermal envelopes in terms of energy savings, in terms of comfort and durability? So sun has never been so cool. Uh, solar technology has been around for a long time, but now if you ask anybody, like, I expect you guys to know about solar, but you, know, you can ask the other Joe down the street, if they know about Tesla, they most likely do now. In a similar way, more and more people start to know what a Tesla battery looks like. And so solar has definitely become mainstream now. These strange guys looking, showing 
roof tiles, and roof tiles are now cool for some reason. And this was a picture on, in New York, Louis Vuitton window, in this year uh, in June. So PVs are like the hot stuff out there, and apparently fashion, de fashion designers are looking at solar to kind of show how cutting edge they are. However, uh, buildings should be for people, and so uh, you should not be thinking of uh, energy efficiency as an add-on that you just buy, slab on your roof, and you're done with it. Because you can have a very efficient, energy efficient building and still have mold inside your building and that building can still get you sick. Now you have your typical small American house and I would like you to think of a building as your third skin. So basically our second skin is the clothing we're wearing all the time. And then the third skin is the building that surrounds us. Now this is very important for our health and comfort because we spend most of our life inside buildings. And so this environment has a, a tremendous impact on, uh, the, uh, on our health and comfort. Uh, health and comfort means having even temperature around us. If I have a very old window, single pane glass, I can have my room at 74 degrees, I'm still going to feel cold because my body is geared towards understanding the temperature difference and if there's such a big temperature difference I'm going to feel cold even if the average of my room is very hot. Uh, air drafts are tedious. They are very bad for a number of reasons but in the first place they are very make, uh, makes a building very uncomfortable and more than condensation should just not be there. It's 2019 I would hope I would not have to stress the fact that buildings should not be moldy. Mold is still an issue we are still here. Uh, indoor air quality should be high and there's a number of parameters that you can evaluate indoor air quality. There's now uh, in the past few years uh, sensors for indoor air quality have become much more affordable so you can measure how much particular matter you produce while you're cooking or how much VOC your new IKEA furniture unleashes. So all of that is helping raising the culture of, of the quality of our built environment. So far, the biggest gap I see is that we just don't consider buildings to uh, have a potential to be much better. We just expect buildings to be not very good anyway. And if you do that, if you build a very uh, well-built buildings, they, they become also much more resilient if you have a, uh, an extreme weather event. So if power goes out, big snow dump uh, over the weekend, you know, you, if, you're, if it is well insulated, well, well air sealed, your building is going to remain more cons constant for a much longer time. Uh, that picture shows uh, mold forming on the internal surface of a room, and that is the consequence of an energy retrofit. The homeowner just replaced the windows because code allowed them to, and that removed a bunch of air leaks, which is good for energy efficiency, very bad for moisture management. And so that, that, caused, uh, that caused the building to become more energy efficient and much less healthy. And you would hope that code is structured to prevent that. It is not. So that is a very real possibility for energy retrofits or even for new buildings. Uh, Conservation versus compensation is a basic uh, concept that I would like you to consider when talking about energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with passive solar? Cool. So passive solar is a movement started with the first oil crisis or a little bit earlier than that where you basically have, you consider all the heat losses that you have in winter time through your house that are those arrows you know, air leaks, heat going through the assemblies, and you know, those poor packages are your heat losses, and then you compensate with having a bunch of solar gains. So, you know, sun, when sun is shining, you get heat. Colorado has a very favorable climate for that, so uh, that is a good way to offset some of the heat losses. So this, that is something that started decades ago. Um, and, and there's also other, uh, currents in the passive solar, with, including food production, solar panels, and all of that. But basically, it's a way to 
bring in a lot of solar gains into the house to kind of uh, provide free heating. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with net zero? Okay, so net zero is a, uh, an American standard where you basically calculate how much, heat, uh, how much energy your building consumes over a year. And if you offset that with renewables over a year, uh, and if the sum is positive or zero, that is a net zero building. So you basically calculate how much energy your building consumes over an entire year, and you offset that amount with renewables. That is good for the big picture. It doesn't say anything about the quality of the building. You can still have more than condensation in net zero building. I know net zero buildings in Colorado that have uh, very bad windows, like non-thermally broken aluminum windows, where you can basically stick your hand to the sash. There's plenty of air leaks but they offset an enormous amount of energy with PVs, that is a net zero building. You still feel pretty cold in, when you are inside it, and if they have uh, moisture, they can have condensation on those windows. So net zero is very good for the big picture planet uh, discussion, but people, I mean, buildings should be for people first, so the, the, as a standard, doesn't say uh, anything for the quality of the building. So, uh, this is why we as a company have come to using the passive house standard as a, our internal benchmark, which is uh, a more evolved uh, standard than the passive solar because of all a bunch of details I'm going to uh, describe you later. And it, uh, with the proper compensation, it can, get, uh, it can become a very streamlined way to net zero. But the concept is you start with a bunch of uh, heat losses and you, in the first place, you make your building better so you reduce the, the energy consumed in the first place. And then you add some solar. If you add some renewables, you can get to zero very easily. But the core is that the building is built much better in terms of insulation, quality of windows, air sealing, and other parameters. So it's much better building itself. It will need less compensation, but it has a much better moisture control strategy and much, much better in dollar quality. So the cornerstones of the uh, passive uh, thermal envelope are thermal insulation and some thermal mass, avoiding thermal bridges, and I'm going to explain in a second what those are, uh, having high quality windows and doors that are suitable for the climate. So if you live in a very mild climate, you can get away with using very average windows because more than condensation is not a big deal. If you live in a very cold climate, you definitely want to have high quality windows and doors in order to have uh, thermal comfort and avoiding condensation. Indoor quality is a huge parameter in passive house and it should be in any buildings because that is what we breathe all the time. And uh, lastly, air tightness. I'm gonna explain how air tightness is linked not only to energy efficiency and comfort, but also to the durability of buildings. And basically, you want to basically wrap your entire envelope uh, with good quality construction. The thermal envelope is whatever, whatever uh, assemblies, so wall, ceiling, floor, uh, doors and windows that encloses the part of the building that you condition in summertime and wintertime. So basically, you create this balloon that you have high control over in terms of moisture management and thermal insulation. That is your thermal envelope, and that should be going all around your building. So the first cornerstone of the passive house envelope is thermal insulation and thermal mass. And this should be a very self-explanatory picture. On, the, uh, on your right-hand right side, you have a coffee pot. And on your left-hand side, you have a thermos. How, how many of you are familiar with both? Pretty straightforward, right? Now, if you're looking at uh, an infrared picture of that, it looks like this. High temperature, like the purple means high temperature, meaning that if you unplug the coffee pot, it gets cold very quickly because there's no thermal insulation there, right? So it consumes a lot of energy, has 
very little resiliency. So the moment you unplug it, it goes cold very quickly. On the left-hand side, you have the, si uh, the thermos, which is insulated. So it, it, the, whatever is inside stays warm or cold for a long time. That is a very resilient container, right? The same applies to the thermal envelope of a good quality building. And that is why we need thermal insulation. Thermal insulation keeps the heat inside or outside. So it helps also in summertime. Uh, it keeps also the sound out. For most types of thermal insulation, uh, especially fibrous uh, thermal insulation, also has an added value of providing sound insulation. And it basically allows a much deeper control over the environment you are conditioning. So if you insulate your, your bubble a lot, you need very little heating and cooling uh, to keep it comfortable. And it protects uh, from swings of ex the external climate. So if you have a heat wave in summertime, or if you have a cold blizzard in wintertime, however much insulation you have, it protects it, it keeps it much more constant. And that is primarily the role of thermal insulation. Um, thermal mass helps, but thermal mass has been proven to help much less than thermal insulation. So thermal mass improves the use of solar heat gains, meaning that if you have a window like on your right hand side and you have the solar gains coming in, the thermal mass heats up and it stores the heat. But the thermal mass that uh, is actually uh, more suitable is the first couple of inches. So it doesn't really ma matter to have like a whole foot of thermal mass because the mass that is inside that wall is going to be too far, too far from the internal environment to be engaged in controlling that environment. Uh, it, thermal mass uh, helps balancing out temperature and some kind of mass like um, stabilized concrete earth blocks, like clay pretty much, also helps balancing out the moisture. Now, we talked about thermal insulation. Thermal bridges are weak spots of any insulation layer. And this is a picture, I hope, is it clear enough? Yeah. Okay. So this is a photo taken in Golden last year. And you see a siding on the, on the side of the building and you see uh, vertical streaks that represent where the wood studs are. Basically wood has much less thermal insulation property than actual thermal insulation. So heat finds a way to escape through that interruption of the insulation layer. And that is a thermal bridge. Basically, insulation creates a gap between your internal environment and your external one. And a thermal bridge is a bridge over this gap. And all of those streaks, vertical streaks are the studs creating a thermal bridge effect. Uh, something that may be more familiar, uh, if you look at frost or snow on, onto roofs, the, the, the places where snow melts first is where the thermal bridges are. So you don't, you don't need a, a, an infrared camera to look at thermal bridges, you just look at snow and where it melts first. Uh, basically what's happening is that you have this assembly, um, whether your wall or, or, or your roof, and the green stuff in between is thermal insulation, and in an infrared analysis, it should look like this, where it's all nice and even rainbow from the red where it's warm inside. You see all evenly uh, distributed to the blue side where it's cold. And the, the black line that you see vertically, they're called isotherms, meaning lines with the same temperature. They're all nice and straight because in that picture, you have no interruption of the insulation. So the insulation goes straight through nice and easy, and so do the uh, isotherms. Now, if you have something like a steel stud, like the uh, similar assembly, but the, uh, with the steel stud highlighted in red in the picture, uh, this is what the isotherms look like. They fan out, they go all crazy. And that is because there's a thermal bridge effect that caused by the steel being very good at conducting heat. Conduction is the opposite of insulation. So basically that creates that thermal bridge to, for the, allowing a lot, a lot of heat to escape. Now the consequent, you know, that one up there is a picture from an office building completed in 2016 in Denver, compliant with the 2015 energy code. So code today does not protect you from this. Uh, if you have poor 
Site supervision and, and poor craftsmanship, you may have insulation installed like that. If you have, you know, if you have big gaps of within your insulation, do you expect that to be good? That is clearly not. And the, as a consequence, uh, you know, in the first place, you have high energy bills because you have a lot more heat going through. And as a second consequence, you have localized lower temperatures. And the combination of lower temperature and moisture allows for mold to grow. So again, the picture that I showed you before, they re replaced the windows, they basically increased the moisture level without doing anything to the insulation. And that is where the moisture found the cold spot caused by the thermal bridges. And those were the, the black streaks of, of mold are. Uh, so yeah, thermal bridges are weak spots in the thermal envelope. They yield worse energy performance, allow for mold condensation. And you would hope that building code is structured to prevent this. Unfortunately, to this day, it is not. Uh, the next cornerstone is quality windows and doors. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, the quality is to match the climate. You don't always need to have super high performance windows if your climate is very mild. Uh, they are literally holes in the, in the thermal envelope. The, uh, so they uh, provide solar gains by letting the daylight and heat in. So depending on the type of building you're dealing with, you may want them, typically in residential buildings. You may want to avoid them if you're talking about office buildings, factories. You know, uh, windows are a very dynamic component. Uh, they basically exploit the greenhouse effect. And you may want to use that or not, depending on your climate and the, on the building use. They are critical for comfort and, for, and to avoid mold and condensation. Uh, how many of you guys have seen condensation forming on a window frame? Like, like this guy. Cool. How many of you guys have seen mold forming along a window reveal? How many of you guys have seen ice forming on the inside of windows? I have, Colorado. <laughs> Not something that typically happens in Southern Europe. But you know, you always learn something. And this is a picture taken on a 2015 IECC code compliant window showing 35 degrees. So there's nothing in code that prevents your window to causing more than condensation. And I literally measured 35 degrees on the inside of a window in a brand new window. So with, with energy code requiring buildings to be more and more airtight. They are not there yet uh, to requiring uh, higher standard in, in uh, construction quality. Yes? Could you perhaps explain what happens if there's condensation on the edge of the window? Yes. Uh, so there are, there's a, a number of moisture driven damages that you may have inside your buildings. Uh, in the shorter term, so windows, uh, condensation on windows happens if you have very cold nights and your window is very bad. I've seen frost happening in, in Denver inside windows. And uh, the number of damages you may have, first, in the first place, you may have uh, mold forming on, either on the, uh, on the reveal or if your window is not very clean on the window itself. And mold will be bad for the person. So that will be a health issue. Uh, if you have condensations, uh, so mold can occur even if the surface is completely dry. If you do have condensation, so if you do have water droplet forming on, on the surface, that may also cause to damages to the actual building. Meaning that if, if, there water, if you have a wooden window, for example, that may damage the window over time. Or if that produces a lot of condensation and that condensation trickles down into the wall assembly, that may also cause damage in the, in the long run. So there's a number of issues that are related to uh, moisture, moisture, moisture being around. So the, it, it will depend on uh, what kind of window you have for, for damages. And then overall, for, build, for people, it will uh, substantially decrease the indoor air quality. So you will be breathing mold spores, and that may uh, trigger asthma or other uh, health-related issues. Now, uh, when I was talking about quality windows and doors, I'm referring to windows that have, that are designed to provide even temperatures. 
that is the that is a, the isotherms done on a window uh, where you see the isotherms go nice and easy to the section, meaning that there's no cold spots along the glass edge, for example. And that perf that window will provide a high enough temperature for you to uh, feel uh, warm and comfortable and to avoid condensation on the glass edge. Now, thermal comfort is a defined parameter. It's not just that I feel cozy and I'm good. From a technical point of view, it means that the surface of the window has an average temperature that is uh, around 64 or 65 degrees in winter time, with your room being around 68 to 70. So the, the temperature gap between your coldest spot and your average temperature is narrow enough so that my body does not feel the difference. So thermal comfort is a very defined technical parameter. Uh, do you guys know what, the, what could be the average internal temperature on a, cold, on a brand new cold window when you have 14 degrees outside? Yeah, 14 degrees outside, uh, you go to Home Depot and you buy a cold window, you install it, and you can expect to have around 50 to 52 degrees inside. That is, that is cold. You know, so when we're talking about value and we're talking about, you know, you know if you just want to plant something in your wall hole to keep rain out is one thing, and that is cold. If you also want your building to be comfortable, you want to look at other, at other options. Passive house window in, a, for example, in climate zone five where we are now, when we have 14 degrees outside, the average temperature would be 64. Big gap there for comfort. Also a lot of energy savings, but in the first place you feel warm. Just because our climate is cold, it doesn't mean that we have to be cold in, inside our buildings. That is a very big cultural uh, thing that we have to learn. We do not need to feel cold inside our buildings if the climate is cold. Uh, indoor quality is the fourth cornerstone of uh, good thermal envelopes. Uh, we just saw how condensation can be bad. Uh, probably, you probably know that a lot of construction materials can release uh, chemicals, including VOCs and formaldehyde, uh, that can be toxic for you. Uh, cooking is probably one of the biggest uh, pollutants that you may have inside your homes. Now, I'm Italian, so I'm never going to tell you to stop cooking at, at home. It's very good if you do. But you need to be aware that in, in uh, whether you have a, a gas burning uh, stove or induction cooking, you're still cooking something and that releases a particular matter. So you do need to have good ventilation. Other chemicals come from detergents, uh, and there is the myth of buildings that may or should breathe through the skin. How many of you guys think that? How many of you guys breathe through their skin? So this is the biggest animal that breathes through its skin. It's a little salamander. Uh, it is very inefficient exchange, so it, it needs to be constantly next to water to keep its skin uh, wet. It has no heat or moisture recovery, so if this little guy would be out in, outside right now, would die immediately, and has no control over pollutants, meaning that they only live where the water is very clear. No, with no pollution, otherwise they would absorb that immediately. Uh, just for fun, uh, this is some monitoring I did in my apartment in Nevada. The red line at the top is the temperature. This was last summer. And this was me trying to cool down the place in the early morning. You see, I opened the window around 6, temperature drops, particular matter skyrocket. The, uh, the green and the orange is pollution, particular matter. So the moment you open your windows, pollution goes up. And that is the effect of manual ventilation. You have no control over the quality of the air coming in. The second graph is, uh, again, the, the red line is the temperature. The green and orange that are very close to one another, so you can probably not tell, is the particular matter, again, pollution. And that is my apartment throughout the day. Then I go home and cook. And I don't have a vented kitchen. So that pollution goes through the roof. So pollution from the outside and pollution from the inside. If you don't have a good ventilation strategy, you are exposed to having a very polluted internal environment. 
Now, how many of you guys have a mechanical ventilation system? Okay. I think a lot of people in the room are lying because we all have one. This is a mechanical ventilation system. Human lungs or animal lungs are a mechanical ventilation system. And you have an efficient exchange of air coming in. You do have heat and moisture recovered inside our nose, and you do have some control over pollutants, what you know, Mother Nature could do. Now, so if, if you look at uh, buildings that should be more closely uh, to meeting uh, the needs of the human body, you should be looking at mechanical ventilation systems. Because in the first place, uh, you do want to supply fresh air to rooms where people are. And you do want to supply the right amount of air to places where people are. That is something you cannot control by just opening your windows. Air is extremely lazy. So if you open the window, it doesn't necessarily move. I mean, winter time, yes, you open your window, you feel all the cold air coming in. Doesn't happen in mid-season and summertime because there's not enough pressure difference. And so even if you were to open the window regularly, and if you didn't have the external pollution problem that I showed you before, you will still have no control over exactly how much air you're supplying. So a relatively simple uh, solution that is available right now is they're called ventilation units. They could be, they're called HRVs or ERVs. HRV means heat recovery ventilation. And ERV means enthalpic recovery ventilation, meaning heat recovery me recovers only sensible heat. That is the heat that you measure with a the thermometer. And enthalpic means it recovers sensible and latent, which means it also recovers the moisture. So if you're supplying enough uh, air to a building, you are in, in, in a climate like Colorado, you are also dehumidifying the environment. If you have uh, external air at 20 degrees at 90% relative humidity, and you bring it inside to, at an, in an environment where you probably have around 68, 70 degrees and around 40% relative humidity, you still have more moisture inside than you have outside. So this process basically dries out your internal environment. And that is typical also of very leaky buildings very leaky, building, very leaky buildings where you have your furnace blowing in hot air, basically they, they dry your place out. Now, the more you make your buildings airtight, and airtightness is good, as I'm going to show you in the next slide, the more you're keeping the moisture inside. But if you keep the moisture inside, then you raise a whole different level of issues, like the mold condition that I showed you before. Now, a heat recovery ventilation unit is basically a box, not very poetic, with two fans moving air, basically blowing air from the outside and, and extracting air from the inside. And in, the, in between, you have a heat recovery core, which is basically a honeycomb, where the two air flows do not mix. But the extract air basically uh, provides free preheating to the cold air. And uh, we've, we've been measuring that if you have uh, 70 degrees inside, and uh, sorry, about 30 degrees outside, you can expect your preheating to bring your air up to, uh, say, 60 degrees without any additional heating. They, they can be very efficient machines. Uh, there are, for retrofits, there, there are smaller ones that you can do room by room. So the one showing here requires a ducted system, but there are ductless systems for your building retrofits. Uh, so there are quite a few options out there. I think th uh, these are very uh, important for the indoor quality and the comfort inside your buildings. Now, the last cornerstone of uh, the passive house envelope is the air tightness and build to provide building durability. If you're walking out tonight with one concept, air tightness means durability. You're bu making buildings airtight not to save energy, mostly to prevent building damage. What happens is that this is your wall and the red dash line is uh, your vapor retarder, which contributes to reducing the amount of vapor that goes through. Vapor goes through solid bodies all the time. So even if you had a concrete wall, you would still have vapor migrating through the concrete wall, 
from the environment where you have higher vapor pressure to the environment with lower vapor pressure. And a way to, do, to control that is uh, to, to use uh, vapor retarders. Now, if you have cracks in your vapor control layer and you let air to move through it as if it was a, like a little wind, you have a lot, uh, a lot higher risk for building damage. The reason for that is that if you look at the isotherms again, you have this little air stream going through your assembly and in its path it finds a cold spot where it can actually uh, cool down to the point where it can condensate. And condensation may lead to a number of different uh, moisture driven damages and that, those depend on what kind of structure you're dealing with. Uh, typically you have loss of performance because condensation means your insulation gets wet and wet insulation does not insulate. So you have loss in, loss in performance in the first place. Uh, it can lead to biological decay. Basically your wood products rot and you know, become useless and you would need to uh, demolish your wall or replace your studs or, or whatever. In case of metals, it will lead to corrosion, meaning that all your fastness, all your brackets will corrode and will become useless. This is a picture of a roof where uh, they did design it properly. You see they have an air barrier at the bottom and for that climate, uh, that was in Vermont I believe, in that climate they had designed it properly but they had not told the client, they could, the client and the client didn't know, so the client drilled holes in the ceiling to install spotlights, effectively providing a whole bunch of holes for the air convection to happen. And all the moisture being trapped inside led to the, the roof literally rotting. So this is uh, a cause of uh, poor uh, air tightness. Now, if you want to compare uh, vapor diffusion to air convection, convection can lead up to 30 times more moisture into your assembly than vapor diffusion. So a substantial amount of more moisture that you can have uh, being dumped in your assembly. And if you want to build, to build buildings for durability, that is, you want to avoid that at all costs. If you combine all of what we talked about, uh, and if you create your building to be like a thermos, not like a coffee pot, uh, you get a much more resilient building. If you change the conditions, whether it is a snow blizzard or a heat wave, it will remain more comfortable even if the systems fail. How many, how many, how, uh, how many of you guys have seen a PV panel? Hope, hope many of you guys, it's Chris. Uh, how many of you guys have seen a PV panel, a photovoltaic panel? Oh. Okay. Uh, what do you expect uh, the lifespan of a PV panel to be? The lifespan? Yeah. How long do you think you can install? 50 years. 25. After 25 years, in average, you have to replace the entire PV system. And more importantly, if you have uh, extreme weather events, there are much more sensitive, delicate uh, system than just a wall. Because if you have a big hailstorm on your wall, you may need to just replace the siding. If you have a big hailstorm on your PV system, you have to throw away the whole lot. So basically, in investing in the thermal envelope provides a much more resilient building. It's never too late. Uh, this applies to new construction as well as retrofit, because physics knows no age. Uh, potentially, you can save up to 95%, you can achieve up to 95% reduction in heating and cooling demand, demand compared to existing buildings. And even compared to brand new buildings, we're talking about 75%. So if your brand new building consumes five, a passive house envelope consumes, sorry, if it consumes four, a passive house envelope consumes one. That is the big gap that there is between code and passive house uh, energy efficiency. Uh, this is a building, was a building in Germany, had a very big uh, heating demand, and they brought it down to by 94%. So this is possible, this is not fairy tales. Now, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think we are just used to considering buildings to be meh anyway. And we are much more used to evaluating values in objects such as smartphones or cars. So we're gonna do an exercise right now 
and in for value evaluation for a car. And we're going to do exactly the same in the next slide for buildings. So what value do I look for, for, uh, for in a car? Uh, this is uh, the dream car. The, uh, and you know, I start to ask myself questions. Do I want it to be a status symbol? I'm going to run to a whole bunch of questions and see how to I can make it cheaper and still meet the value that I'm looking for. So I'm basically going to list questions and making it cheaper and cheaper. So does it need to be a status symbol? Does it need to be a sports car? Does it need to be red? Does it need to have leather seat? I don't know, mid, you know mid, midlife crisis, whatever you have in mind. <laughs> Does it need to be fuel efficient? Maybe, you know, this is, we are starting to hit something that, you know, comes uh, closer to home for most of us. Uh, does it need to be comfortable, quiet? Does it need to have a ventilation system? Who of us would buy a car today without a ventilation system? Does it need to have airbags? Does it need to have seat belt? You know, I'm st we are removing items from the car just to make it cheaper and cheaper as we go. Does it need to have lights? Does it need to be safe? Does it need to have a hood and doors? You know, we, are, we are getting here pretty much. And does it need to have a steering wheel? You know, you know, this, and I'm sure that in your head, everybody of you has drawn a line and I say, I'm not gonna go below this, okay? Maybe it's not gonna be a sports car, maybe it's going to be red, but you know, maybe not a fancy red, you know. Uh, so, in, when we're talking about anything really, oftentimes you ask yourself, what's the ROI, what's the return of investment of this item that I'm purchasing, right? So if I'm looking at, I don't know, if I'm getting a fuel efficient car and I'm, uh, the uh, dealer is charging me five grand more to get the more efficient model, is that, is that going to pay back? You know, we, we do this math sometimes. There are some, some items we cannot just evaluate in that way. We, there's no ROI for seat belts. There's no ROI for an airbag. 20 years ago, cars did not have airbags. Now you cannot buy a car without an airbag. So uh, when you look at ROI for value, maybe that is just not the right question. Let's do the same for buildings. We we'll started with the mega mansion and we're going cheaper. So does it need to be a status symbol? Uh, does it need to be in the fancy part of town? If you know anything about real estate, location, location, location drives the price. Does it need to have Greek columns at the entrance? If you have ego or whatnot. Uh, does it need to have imported floor tiles? You know, sometimes we have to discuss with clients whether or not they're gonna have uh, ventilation unit and then they spend, I don't know, 100 bucks per square foot on imported Spanish tiles. You know, it's all about seeing value in what you're buying. Does it need to be comfortable? Does it need to be, hang on, uh, does it need to be quiet, energy efficient? You know, we are starting to get into things that are more familiar with us. Does it need to have healthy indoor air? Does it have to be mold free? In 2019, we are still discussing mold in buildings. We have not gotten very far as mankind. Does it need to last a thousand years? Does it need to last five years? You know, have you ever asked yourself when you're building or purchasing a building, how long is this building going to last? Have you ever asked yourself this question? And we're getting to much more, much more in touch with nature. <laughs> Does it need to keep most of rain, snow, wind outside? Does it need to have running water? Does it need to have window and doors? Does it need to be structurally sound? So pretty much buildings were invented to keep rain and water out. And first requirement was that they should not collapse on people and kill them in the first place. So uh, what code gets you is to here. Okay? There's nothing in code guaranteeing durability, mold-free, healthy, comfort, indoor quality. So if you're looking at code, if, if you're comparing anything to code, you're comparing to this. In Passivos, uh, basically with all the control that we talked about, we're trying to get to here. And there's a big gap in value. And just like you cannot assess the ROI of an airbag, there's a lot of ROI that you cannot assess for components. Um, what is the cost associated with living in a moldy building? We're gonna see that in a second. What is the cost associated with living in, a, in an uncomfortable building? It's difficult to quantify that. Uh, 
So we're going to see now a little bit of a case study comparing what, what the cost would be to build to code versus to build to passive house in different areas in the States. It's a very large country. <laughs> and uh, this is a map showing population density, showing different climate zones, showing cost of electricity, showing availability of solar for both solar gains in the passive house and for uh, production of the PV system that we're going to evaluate in a second. Now, uh, how many of you guys think that energy prices go up with time? Do you think that 10 years ago energy prices were lower than today? Raise, raise your hand if you think that today's prices are higher than 10 years ago. Okay. So that is something that, that comes up oftentimes uh, when, while talking about energy efficiency. And this is a graph showing the cost of electricity in the States from the 1920s until yeah, 10 years ago. And once you factor in inflation, it's pretty flat. Okay? So uh, I guess it's, uh, you cannot really use the uh, card of energy prices going up in this country compared to other countries because they've been pretty flat uh, over time. And same, hap sorry, and same happens with natural gas in the past 20 years has been pretty constant over time. So energy prices are not going to go up. And this analysis that we're going to go through right now is combining all of these. So uh, population density drives cost of energy and climate zone, so climate zone uh, drives heating and cooling demand and also drives the availability of, of solar. Uh, so energy in the US is not getting any more expensive. Uh, this is a table comparing uh, the cost of uh, the energy savings for a passive house over a brand new building. And it is uh, done over a certain period of time. Now, how many of you guys have been in the same place for a year or longer? In the same house or apartment for a year or longer? Okay. How about five years or longer? Okay. Ten years or longer? Okay. 25 years or longer. Okay, good. So the average, uh, and this is very important because it shows uh, myths in, the, in our building culture. So if you ask an average American, they believe that uh, they stay in the same place for five years or less. The national statistic is that the average American family stays in the house for 13 years or longer. So if you're talking about ROI of an investment in your building, you should consider at least 13 years. So what this table is showing is the saving of a passive house over a brand new 2015 code building over 15 years for, for heating and cooling and for offsetting the, the energy consumed to achieve net zero. So uh, in the first column, you have the location. There's a bunch of different climate zones of the US, so we have 15 locations. There's also Denver at the bottom. Uh, there's what, what US climate zones uh, th they refer to. Then the third column from the left is savings on heating and cooling over 13 years, because that is, that is the average time an American family will stay in the place. And then the, the savings on installing a photovoltaic system to offset that energy uh, to, to reach net zero. And the last column on the right shows the combined savings. Now, it's a very large country. You can see how if you build to this level in Los Angeles, you would save only about $2,600 over 13 years, so very little because it's a very mild climate. New York City, we are talking about 25 grand because it's an intermediate climate and the cost of energy is much higher. Denver, for those of you, I mean, it's a very small font, but we are talking about $17,000. Okay, just looking at energy. This is just the ROI consideration. Not considering the fact that if you build to code, you have no control over your indoor quality, uh, condensation issues, and comfort, meaning the uh, temperature evenness inside your buildings, such as the, the quality of your windows. Now, in my head, the, there's extra value in investing the same amount of money, whether or not you reach to the, whether or not you go all the way to this level of 
efficiency, you could still invest in more insulation and better windows than just code. And the value of that is you get more comfort and more efficiency, more efficiency overall. And more importantly, uh, the building envelope components have a much longer lifespan. So we, are talk we talked about 25 years for a PV system. A window can last 40 years or more. Uh, thermal insulation can last 50 years or more. So if, you know, then you, the, the same amount of money is going to last a lot longer because thermal envelope is a much more dumb component than renewables. And dumber means li lives longer. Uh, costs associated with, with living in sick buildings. This is, if this is the condition you're living in, uh, you, you're probably looking at uh, exposing yourself to uh, breathing allergies and other associated uh, diseases. If you get asthma, you can, you're looking at 40 grand over 13 years. These are national statistics from the Department of Health. Removing mold uh, it can be between 500 and 6,000 dollars for a medium-sized house. And so when you, whenever you're choosing uh, to replace a window or to just do something to fix up your place, you should be considering this uh, cost that you may have associated with undoing a damage that you're, that you're causing. Is healthcare in the US going to be any cheaper anytime soon? <laughs> okay, so uh, to summarize uh, what we think about the healthy side of zero energy is high performance thermal envelope are a streamlined path to get into net zero. So you basically reduce the need for energy substantially and then you offset it. So conservation before compensation. Uh, this level of efficiency can be up to 75% more efficient than brand new buildings. So if a brand new building consumes four, this level consumes only one for heating and cooling. Uh, current US code uh, fails in addressing issues such as modern condensation. And we've seen this happen before in Europe. We were architects in Europe for eight years, and we've seen the same exact thing happen just 10 years earlier. And code there is just now adopting additional measures to prevent modern condensation to happen. Uh, building should be for people, so whatever efficiency measure you consider for your project or for your own house, think of what consequences it may have on your health and comfort besides energy. Uh, that being said, I thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. How does a rating heating system compare to a forced air system as far as healthy buildings? Uh, so uh, radius, they, can they can both work, and they can both not work for different reasons. Uh, a radiant floor is, can be a very efficient system. In, in that it can be combined with a heat pump, so the heating, the energy consumed can be very little, uh, and it can provide a very even temperature throughout your building. Uh, it cannot be, if you're using that for cooling, it needs to be paired with a dehumidification, even in some areas of Colorado. Uh, it can, it, that was very popular in the 70s until they messed them up, a, a whole number of them, because if your temperature is too high, uh, it can be very bad for your circulatory system. Uh, so that will n just need to be well designed. But it, they, can, they are both good systems. A forced air system, uh, the way they are used in the US, uh, they typically tend to overheat the air coming in, meaning that the, if you uh, heat the air over 120 uh, degrees, you can burn the dust that the air carries, and that can become problematic. Besides the fact that using a forced air system, uh, you supply fresh air, you warm it, up, warm it up substantially. So in our climate, you dry out your internal environment too much. So that, that is my opinion on that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. I've heard that passive view heat with a hairdryer. Uh, you can do that, so uh, if you want. <laughs> if you are into hairdryers. But I mean, it's that. Yes, so basically, uh, basically a passive house envelope 
it can be very, very efficient, meaning uh, compared to a brand new building, your heating system can be up to five, six times smaller. And for a house of about uh, 2,000 square feet of heated area, of, of treated area, you can literally heat it up uh, with, a, with a single hairdryer. Because it, we're talking like three uh, BTU per square foot per hour, uh, if you want. There's nothing you, stopping you from using radiant, using uh, fan cores, using electrical resistance. You know, you can use any system you want, but literally, literally that is the size of the system, of the heating system we're talking about. Yes. Yes. As an example, there's a, a pass pass that we did in Italy that uses um, a towel warmer in the bathroom. It's the pass. So have, have friends over. Yeah. Yeah, basically you exploit your friends to provide the heat and then you send them home afterwards. Just, <laughs> just need to have the right amount. Of, uh, we, we teach a, a class and, and one of the examples I show, you know, you, you can use a hairdryer, you can use, I don't know, 80 candles. I calculate the number of cats that you can use to heat up your house. I don't remember by heart, but it, it is insane, like in, in the number of like 20, not, not insane. If you like cats, you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, we are talking about very efficient envelopes, so you can keep it inside, and so you need a lot less than even compared to. We are talking about compared to a brand new, compared to an existing building, 20 times smaller heating system, one to 20. Compared to a brand new building, one to five. So much smaller. And the cost and the savings associated with having. A smaller heating system were not showing in the table I showed you before, because we don't have enough case studies yet to build up a case for that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry. Yes. In your experience, what is the sort of additional investment, maybe a piece of capital, required to construct? A passive house that is all the way up to comfortable in your chart, yes. rather than whatever standard practice in the building. Yes. So uh, I was talking to somebody in Colorado Springs last, last week, and they built their own house. They were very meticulous about comparing costs, and they were telling me about eight percent. I. I've not seen the data yet, but it is consistent what we had experience with in different cases in Europe. Europe now is lower because just because the code is higher, and, and so the gap is smaller. So, and this is single family. Single family is uh, has the hardest time because you have more square feet of walls, more num higher number of windows compared to a multi-unit. Um, uh, apartment building, an apartment building or an office building, you can build to code cost. Just because you invest in the envelope, you save dramatically on the on the equipment, and so if you if it is designed well, you can build at cost, so at code cost. But yeah, for single family, we're talking about eight to ten percent in the U.S. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, in the back. Sorry. As a company, do you do mostly like retrofit, retrofitting old buildings or construction from new buildings? And can you talk about kind of like the difference of efficiency and price? Yes. Of so as a as a company, uh, we don't build and we don't design. We do train builders. Uh, we do consult with manufacturer. We do some consult for some project specific consulting if it is uh, larger buildings. Uh, Otherwise, we try to promote standardized construction practices where we would provide you know, standardized solutions for single family, for example, just so that you can get to the quality and be able to build, but just not having the uh, fees associated with uh, a lot of calculation and consulting. Now, as far as uh, new construction versus retrofit, um, you can get all the way to passive house level in retrofit. If you, you know, depend, depend, you know, that of it's always more difficult and more complicated project than new construction, uh, but you can still get there. Um, we, we, the, the example I was showing showed 94% redu reduction in heating and cooling demand. So it, you can be 
uh, doing a dramatic change in how the building not only performs, but also how it feels and how healthy and comfortable it can be to occupants. Uh, the main difficulties in associated with um, retrofits are typically in the air sealing because it's more difficult than just slabbing some insulation on. And you could do retrofits in step by step. If you have, if you have a, management, a property management company, for example, you say, okay, we ha just had a big hailstorm and all the south siding of the facade needs to be redone. That is the most cost-effective moment to just add insulation on the building because you have to replace the component anyway. Or if your windows get broken for whatever reason, that, that is the best moment to say, I'm not going to stick to cold windows. I'm going to, you know, my windows are dead. I have to replace them anyway. So I'm going to just do that portion and replace the windows with high performance ones. You just need to be careful in making sure that by fixing one issue, you're not opening the door for other issues like the mold uh, case that I was showing. New construction should be easy enough. Like there's no, you know, the way you build in the States is so much easier than, uh, I was trained and did a bunch of experience using masonry uh, and concrete. So if you compare that to stick frame or timber frame, uh, American practices are typically much easier to deal with. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other, yes. There's a, um, a site in Boulder that had a hospital that's changing over to a new development because the hospital moved east. Um, I really liked your slide where it described that, do, that rebuild or redevelop. Uh, also, we have the opportunity zone now in Boulder where we've exempted the moratorium against it based on one redevelopment or two affordable housing. Okay. Um, so I'm impressed with the, re, you know, the redevelopment issue um, of your presentation. And um, how could I say? Um, but at what point, do, like, I'm really upset that this hospital is being deconstructed, even though it's being de deconstructed. And I think the process of deconstruction, I don't know. I think a lot of stuff really ends up in the landfill, mm. you know, and this is really what you're talking about. And this is not Europe where we've got thousand year old buildings, which we should have. Well, you know, in my experience, uh, if a bit, you know, the, some buildings are worth keeping and some others are not. Uh, and just from a purely, you know, I understand your point. If, if the building has historic value, uh, it probably does make sense. Uh, I've also enjoyed the having to deal with Italian bureaucracy about historic buildings that were just buildings, ugly old buildings. And, you know, if we're meaning, if we actually mean to build efficient buildings, that are good for people in a cost-effective way, some buildings are worth keeping and some others are not. Because, you know, if, if, there's, if it, there's no historic value and it's just an old building and it's going to cost a lot of money to fix it, and if it is, I mean, uh, I convinced my family to demolish the house I grew up in. I'm the kind of son. <laughs> <laughs> and to Italians, that is huge. And the, the reason, and my grandfather had built that building. So horrible thing to do a family. Uh, but that building was built uh, with no universal access concept at all. You would have steps inside the building to go from your bedroom to your bathroom, like four or five steps. And my grandmother literally spent the last 20 years of her life being trapped inside the building because she could hardly walk. So uh, at some point, we had a big Italian family meeting, and uh, we are not the Sopranos, but close. Uh, and we decided to, we, we had to evaluate whether or not we were going to fix the old building or demolish it entirely and do something else. And it, would, it costed the same amount of money to fix it, to fix the old building to code, than to just demolish the old structure and do some uh, two houses with full universal access and passive house. 
So the value of the building, it really depends on looking at the structure if it is. So if, if you're talking about a landmark, the, the old hospital, it may make sense from a city point of view to keep it if it is something worth historically. But uh, not all buildings are uh, meant to be saved because they were most likely not designed to be uh, reusable and being fixable. Like the biggest constraint in my parents' house was uh, universal access. My parents are now 70 and you know, they, are go they were going to be prisoner of their building for the remaining years of their life and that is why we decided to demolish the building instead of having them using only part of the building. Because that building was not designed in the first place to be universally accessible. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So then you'd want to design buildings that are transformable space. Yes. And your grandfather should, didn't do that. Well, the, my grandfather was the carpenter and they hired an architect and it's always the architect. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, it's, it's You're an architect. Uh, oh yeah, that's the funny part. <laughs> <laughs> but recovering architect, so no longer... <laughs> Repenting architect? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, can you say something about the value of the property over a standard building as you get to approach net zero and beyond? What, what, how does that change in the market these days? So and I'm sure it depends on where you are in the nation and all that, but let's assume Denver, Boulder, whatever. Is, so, is there something about so, that? Uh, there is something like that where the market has learned to acknowledge what passive house is because you know you can have the best item and if nobody knows the value of what it is you know there's no added value one issue we've seen in denver and colorado in general is that a lot of realtors don't know what green buildings is like let alone passive or just just green buildings so they will not talk about it and it just ends up being a more expensive building so there's a lot of Communication and needs to happen within the construction industry to trickle down to people that are actually selling the product. Um, the yeah, yeah, you should come. So there's a, a realtor that's really involved with high performance studies um, in Boston and has started to do some kind of solid case studies on what market value differences he sees um, in Boston and has a few really good case studies showing a 25% increase on market value on the homes that are built to passive and lead standards. He was looking at a, a few different certification schemes. New build or? Um, I think okay. these were new build, but I mean, they're, they're so few to look at that it's really on a case study basis rather than an overall study yet, you know? Um, but his, um, one thing that's interesting about it is that basically He's, he promotes in the in the real estate industry um, the knowledge of the green appraisal addendum, and I don't even totally know what that is. But there is a, a method of appraising green buildings. There's an addendum that's been added to the way that they do this. Very few realtors know about it. His advice to us here in Colorado, when we were you know teaching our students, our builder students here, is if you have a realtor who doesn't know what it is get a new realtor yeah. mm -hmm. and he said that it's very likely that only one in ten will know what it is but you, you have to be able to have someone who can communicate the value of what you're trying to sell if that's what you're trying to do but are you are they using the 13 year thing um, I'm, not know, sure. I, I'm not sure the 13 year yeah. statistic is from the national the North American Home Builders Association statistics so it's possible as a follow-up to that question was, is there a way for banks yeah. to acknowledge that value? Yeah, a lot of stuff's happening with that now, which is really cool. Um, you know, Fannie Mae has started doing green mortgages. Um, there's some things popping up around that. There's a really cool program, CPACE in Colorado. I don't know if you guys know about that. Um, we've had them come speak at the Denver chapter before, but um, there's some interesting finance things coming up now, yes. <laughs> but. Um, but that's definitely, when, when that starts to get more developed, that's obviously going to help a lot, especially in the single family arena. I think it's, um, in multifamily, it's helping a ton. Um, in the United States, if you look and see where passive house as a standard has really taken off, it's kind of in these odd little pockets everywhere. So New York is really big because um, there's actually language about passive written into the city policy on building code as a streamlined permit path. 
Um, Vancouver has just dedicated their entire building code to going towards passive. San Francisco, I think, has some language. And then randomly in, uh, I think it's pe in Pennsylvania, there's something from the um, housing authority side on the financing mechanism that is incentivizing builders to build passive to the degree that we've got all these builders in Pennsylvania that are like, yeah, 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 we can do that. We can build passive and then are trying to catch up now. So a lot of it is also, and that's why we focus on kind of trades, trades training is because you know, first step was kind of coming at it from a, a design point of view and consulting, okay, and now we need to get the realtors and the finance mechanism involved, and then the big bottleneck's gonna be getting the trades to actually implement it the way it was it was meant to be designed, and you know, because you can design it great, and then it's not built the way it was designed, and you have a problem, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. Was that Vancouver, BC, or Vancouver, yeah. Washington? Yeah, um, BC. Okay. Uh, in the back. I heard that and read that natural buildings like straw bale, hempcrete, aircrete are naturally better at insulating and breathing. Um, is that so, true? Uh, there are a number of, so uh, it is true that they have much lower embodied carbon and embodied energy because you can grow them locally and there's not an industrial process behind it. As far as insulation properties, not really, because if you look at uh, mineral wool, for example, you, you expect four uh, R per inch, so it will get every inch of mineral wool will get you four R value, whereas straw is around two and hempcrete is around 1.2, something like that. So uh, while they are very good materials and there's a number of possibilities built like that, you, de you do need thicker walls because you just need more material. But you can definitely get to that level of insulation using natural material, yes. What's that, hempcrete? Hempcrete is a mixture of hemp fiber from the plant and uh, lime binding. Do you know about aerated autoclave cement? Yes. Uh, not very common in the States. Uh, it's used to create kind of lightweight bricks in Europe. They can be structured for masonry or for IFIS insulation. Uh, it's, they're typically lime-based. It's lime foam, pretty much. It insulates less well than mineral wool or EPS, but it can be very sturdy and very good. Yeah. And acoustic sand, too, actually. The yeah. ones I've Well, got. you have a lot of mass, uh, but then to compare apples to apples, you would have to look at the whole sound reduction of the entire assembly. So there's a number of variables there. Uh, but yeah, it could be good. Yes? What's your typical wall assembly for, uh, to prevent thermal bridging if we're talking standard construction? So thermal bridge, uh, it will depend on the climate because the, harsh, the colder the climate, the more you have to avoid thermal bridges. If you're looking at climate zone two, you probably can avoid caring because you're gonna have other kinds of issues. Uh, and then thermal bridges, uh, we have, we've come up with the analogy, you know, you're, you're looking at mice and elephants sometimes. You know, if you're looking at, uh, if you look up, if you Google, how, how do I avoid thermal bridges in my timber frame, in my stick frame construction? They tell you to stagger them, to do a double star wall and things like that. And we found that uh, wood does create a thermal bridge, but compared to steel, we're comparing an elephant, which is steel, to a mouse that is uh, uh, wood. So depending on the economy of your project, some mice you can get away with, and you just leave them there, as long as hypothetical mice, not <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. Okay. Uh, so small thermal bridges. So step one is looking at uh, modern condensation. Is that thermal bridge going to cause thermal? Because if it is, then you're going to mitigate that or avoid that. If it is not, then you're only looking at the energy balance of the whole building, and you know sometimes it's anti-economical to fix all the thermal bridges just because if they don't cause issues with modern condensation, you may, your building may as well perform very well and live with them. Uh, definitely steel, aluminum, concrete is 
something you want to um, look very closely at because they conduct heat a lot better. Just to give you an example, uh, yeah, uh, com compared to thermal insulation, wood uh, can conduct heat four times better. Uh, steel is around 100 times better. So, you know, mouse, elephant, you know, from a design point of view, it's always a compromise, right? So uh, you can, in, in our climate, if you're looking at a commercial building, you're most likely looking at continuous external insulation, but it doesn't have to be the case. I've been seeing a lot of builders go to that and then insulate the outside of their foundation as well. Yes. Uh, however, there's a lot of people that write articles without doing the, the physics. And that is just a situation of our market. So I'm sorry about that, but it's the way it is. <laughs> yes. I think this might be a similar question. For both commercial and residential, many buildings are built on a slab of concrete. Um, and all I think about that is like enormous heat sink. Uh, a heat sink meaning, well, what is your concern in that case? That, that you're basically losing thermal air, like warm air inside, and conducting it out through the building. You are correct. And so that slab should be insulated. So compared to a crawl space, the ground is typically at a milder temperature, both in the summertime and in the wintertime. So the coupling is good. You just don't want to let the heat out freely. So you do want to put insulation there. How much insulation will depend on your climate. But if you have, I don't know, one unit of insulation inside your wall, you're probably looking at 0 0.6 of insulation under your slab or on top of your slab. But if you are coupled with the ground, the condition is more favorable so you can save some insulation. Does this make sense? OK. Yes. Um trying to formulate this question, but okay, so a lot of power companies offer free energy audits to homeowners, but I don't imagine, you know, they're taking a look at air quality or steel that might be causing condensation or things like that. And I'm guessing that you could have a pretty good energy audit and still have poor ventilation, poor air quality or possible mold happening. So what do you recommend for the homeowner to do to try to, you know, test for those kinds of things? So infrared cameras are now $200 on Amazon, the ones that you plug in onto your phone. And that is something that we use to scale off our builders because anybody in this room can go tonight and buy an infrared camera. So if, they, if, they, if you guys hire an insulation company and then you say, hey, I'm going to be looking at your job with an infrared camera, they're going to pay a lot more attention to what they're doing. It's democracy of data. Uh, the issue with energy audits is the same as the realtors. So code is not there yet. So as long as code is not there yet and the issues are not there openly yet, the, ma the mainstream is not there yet. Unfortunately, it's a very reactive industry, the construction industry. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of information out there is that if you Google, hey, how do I fix my house, is oftentimes incomplete. Uh, so maybe a good advice would be to uh, look at what kind of education the auditor has besides just code, because that would be a good start to get the right guy. There's a very big range of yeah. inspectors. Yeah. Kind of a inside background. How do you propose to get code to change? This is a theme that you brought up a lot. I mean, well, this is so archaic, you know? See, I, I, having been an architect in Italy and having had to deal with code for a number of years, I'm much, very much against uh, making anything mandatory because it can be very poorly written. I think education and better awareness from clients is a very good answer to that because basically if you drive for better demand, then everybody's going to follow. Code, I'm not, uh, I mean, I just want to highlight the fact how code is faulty just because 
you know, buildings can be a lot much, much, much better and code is not there. Code may get there at some point. The focus seems to be energy as it, as it is in Europe. And just in Europe, the focus has shifted uh, to, towards moisture management just because they've started to see so many cases of mold that they had to do something about it. But I'm not, I am not suggesting to make any, anything mandatory because it can be increasing the bureaucracy exponentially and not really providing value to the actual buildings. So I think awareness and events like this where you basically inform the public is, is a better way to go. Yes. So concerning air quality, what, what you just raised, the question, in your slide where you showed pollutants coming in from the outside yes. and pollutants being generated, when yes. you cook, what particles or chemicals did you look at and how expensive is your sensor to pick up them? So those were, uh, we were looking at uh, particular matter 2.5 and 10. Beg your pardon? particular matter size 2.5 and 10, PM 2.5 and PM 10. And the uh, sensor we, we were using are, uh, were donated from us uh, by a company that does monitoring of indoor quality. Those are around 800 bucks each, those sensors. You can find cheaper stuff, uh, and cheaper, st cheaper stuff gives you a more qualitative uh, feedback. So maybe the, the actual numbers are not 100% accurate, but they will, they will still show you peaks in pollution. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not too sure about, uh, I think you, if you can pay a couple of hundred bucks, you can buy uh, particular meta sensors today online. So if you cook not with gas, you create particular? I don't have gas at my place. That, that peak was particular matter, just me cooking on my electric stove. But you wouldn't measure, you know, volatile chemicals from your furniture or your... Well, lighting. that unit specifically does uh, monitor also VOCs, volatile organic compound. It was just not showing in the graph. Yes. Oh, we showed POCs. P uh, PM, particular Part matter. Oh, particular. Yes. Not. Yes. So, uh, my question is, if I have um, a, um, square foot limitations, <coughs> A square, foot square foot limitations. Yes. Um, is that going to be based on the outside wall or the condition space inside? When With they the, say I have a 700 square foot um, limit, I don't know. That depends okay. On your building, your local yeah. It's a what? It depends on your local building code. Uh -huh. Yeah. I I honestly don't know the answer to that. Okay. Yeah. But you 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 would probably go to your local uh, permit office and ask that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, back home, back home it depended on different municipalities. You know, some of them were net, some of them were gross, but you would probably want to ask your permit office. Well, we're talking about what, uh, thick walls here, so yeah. it yeah. really does make a difference. Yeah. So there was a follow-up question on that side. Or did you have one? Um, well, it's different. Okay. The extra cost of a passive house, yes. let's say 8%. Yes. Could you say in a simplistic way what percentage is spent on the walls and roofs yes. versus on the windows and roofs? So windows, so compared to code, the insulation values for walls and ceilings are not too far off, are very similar. What is a big gap is windows. So 2015 code windows for climate zone 5 have the same uh, thermal properties that was used in the 70s in Sweden. So code in the States is very far behind. And that is where you have the biggest gap because code is so much, so, so much lower. So a passive house window that will be suitable in our climate costs about uh, easily twice as much as a code window, easily. Walls and roofs, not, not too much. Uh, air ceiling, uh, the code has now started to require air sealing of your building, so that cost is dropping. The cost, the cost gap is dropping dramatically now because code buildings are required to have uh, air sealing level, uh, three, yeah, just l uh, a lot less stringent than passive house, but you know, that being required, then the, the cost gap is much narrower. Does it make sense? 
Yes. Sorry. Is there an optimal size house? One of the debates going on in Boulder these days is, can, are, do we have ADUs, ad accessory yes. dwelling units? Are yes. they, you know, and people are building new ones, potentially. There's yes. a new ordinance. Um, and I, I just wonder about the optimal value of an entire separate structure and the heating and cooling and all the energy efficiency for that versus the optimal size of a house. Because we're also having the debate about large houses, lot sizes, yeah, and this yeah. kind of thing. Is Defin there an optimum? Well, we're definitely looking of shifting the debate towards quality versus quantity here. To, to, from shifting towards quality versus quantity. Yeah. Uh, but I, I cannot really answer your question. I don't think there's any optimal size. Like a 20,000 square foot house versus a 5,000 thou, versus uh, a 20,000? I don't think there's an optimal anything because, you know, buildings are like people. That there's not one like the other. So I, there's, I don't think there's any optimal size for anything. And you can have these systems that are it for each room, like the HRV you versus could. one that do, you know, There's you've got one a, system that's... I mean, basically, the, basically, it's all performance-based, and depending on what your building is, and what your size is, and what your climate is, you're going to have answers. Basically, this was a highlight of, if you don't follow the rules, you're going to have these kind of issues. And instead, if you do follow the, the rules, you're going to have these uh, sets of values. But they are flexible and um, performance based, there's not one optimal size for the house for that. So I don't have an answer for the question. Do you have a question? Yes. We just have time for just one more question. Yeah, okay. Oh. Uh, let's say I, there's a whole bunch of condensation on my windows. Is yeah. there anything to do besides just get new windows? Uh, improving ventilation. I mean, in the first place, you want to see where the moisture is coming from. Family of four people, I did not mention this today, but the family of four people produces every day two and a half gallons of moisture which is a lot. Uh, so in the first place, you want to see, uh, we did uh, one uh, energy retrofit back home where they called us because apparently we, we have become the mold guys. Like, I don't know why, but <laughs> it was definitely not intention. But anyway, they had mold issues. And so they called us and they, of course, they had replaced the windows. So we saw mold in the usual spots, you know, the corner of the, the walls. And then there was one spot in, on an, an internal wall where this, there was this whole cloud, like three feet up, nothing underneath. Three feet up was this big cloud of mold, like never seen anything like that before. And I asked what it was, and that was the typical spot of Luigi that is a water turtle, so like a big fish pond that they typically kept there, so they kind of emitted moisture constantly, vapor. So that was a very weird source of moisture. Uh, so you, you may have causes like that sometimes. Uh, but yeah, you want to see where your moisture is coming from. And if you don't want to replace your windows, uh, definitely look at ventilation. You know, you, maybe you just crack your windows more often than, you know, if you want, uh, especially in the winter time, uh, that will provide enough dehumidification. Okay, does, does it answer your question? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.